Hello, my name is Denise Fague. This is the chapter on diabetes and pregnancy. The authors were myself, Howard Berger, Lois Donovan, Ariane Godbu, Tina Cater, Aaron Keeley, and Rima Sankara. Diabetes and pregnancy can be looked at under two categories. Pre-existing diabetes, which includes women with type 1 and type 2 diabetes, and gestational diabetes. That is, diabetes diagnosed during pregnancy. First, we will start with pre-existing diabetes and look at preconception counseling. Dysglycemia in pregnancy can result in adverse pregnancy outcomes. We know that hyperglycemia in the first trimester can lead to increased fetal malformations, and hyperglycemia in the second and third trimester can lead to an increased risk of macrosomia and metabolic complications. Here is a graph of the absolute risk of congenital anomalies and the preconception A1C. As you can see, the absolute risk of congenital anomalies increases markedly with increasing A1C, reaching about 20% with an A1C of over 13. In order to prevent these congenital anomalies, women need to make sure that their, hemo their, their glucose control is ideal prior to pregnancy and during the first few weeks of organogenesis. Therefore, reliable birth control is very important. Of note, women with polycystic ovar ovary syndrome should be told that if they do start metformin, it may improve fertility, and they need to be warned about possible pregnancy. Metformin, however, is safe for ovulation induction in PCOS women. Achieving a healthy weight is also essential prior to pregnancy, as obesity is associated with adverse pregnancy outcomes.
A preconception checklist is useful for women with pre-existing diabetes. Firstly, use reliable birth control until adequate glycemic control is achieved. Attain a preconception A1C of under 7% or under 6.5% if considered safe. Women may remain on metformin and or glyburide until pregnancy occurs if they can achieve an A1C under 7%. Otherwise, if they can't achieve an A1C under 7% with these medications, switch to insulin. Women on other oral agents should switch to insulin. Women should be assessed for diabetes complications and those complications should be managed prior to pregnancy. This is different from previous uh, guidelines in that we are recommending one milligram of folic acid three months preconception and up to 12 weeks postconception, whereas previously five milligrams were recommended. Discontinue potential embryopathic medications. These include ACE inhibitors or ARBs and they should be discontinued prior to pregnancy or upon detection of pregnancy in those with significant proteinuria. Also discontinue statin therapy prior to pregnancy. Recommendation one, pre-existing diabetes, preconception care. All women of reproductive age with type one or type two diabetes should receive ongoing counseling on reliable birth control, the importance of glycemic control prior to pregnancy, the impact of body mass index on pregnancy outcomes, the need for folic acid, and the need to stop potentially embryopathic drugs prior to pregnancy. Women with type 2 diabetes who have irregular menses or polycystic ovary syndrome and who lose significant weight or are started on metformin or a thiazolidine diol should be advised that fertility may improve and be counseled regarding possible pregnancy and receive preconception counseling. Before attempting to become pregnant, it is important that women with type 1 or type 2 diabetes receive preconception counseling that includes optimal diabetes management prior to getting pregnant. And this includes nutrition, preferably in cons consultation with an interprofessional pregnancy team to optimize maternal and neonatal outcomes. B. Strive to attain a preconception A1C under 7% or under 6.5% if can safely be achieved to decrease the risk of spontaneous abortion, congenital anomalies, preeclampsia, progression of retinopathy in pregnancy, and stillbirth. C. Supplement their diet with multivitamins including one milligram of folic acid at least three months preconception and continuing until at least 12 weeks of gestation to prevent congenital anomalies. D, discontinue medications that are potentially embryopathic including any from the following classes, ACE inhibitors and ARBs, prior to conception in women with hypertension alone, upon detection of pregnancy in women with considerable chronic kidney disease, such as overt proteinuria, and discontinue statins. Recommendation four, women on metformin and or glyburide preconception may continue on these agents if glycemic control is adequate until pregnancy is achieved. Women on other antihyperglycemic agents 
should switch to insulin prior to conception as there are no safety data for the use of other antihyperglycemic agents in pregnancy. Recommendation 5. Women should undergo an ophthalmological evaluation by a vision care specialist during pregnancy planning the first trimester as needed during pregnancy after that and again within the first year postpartum in order to identify progression of retinopathy. More frequent retinal surveillance during pregnancy as determined by the vision care specialist should be performed for women with more severe pre-existing retinopathy and poor glycemic control, especially those with the greatest anticipatory reductions in A1C during pregnancy in order to reduce progression of retinopathy. Recommendation six, women with albuminuria or chronic kidney disease should be followed closely for the development of hypertension and preeclampsia. Now to management during pregnancy in women with pre-existing diabetes. Women with type 1 diabetes should be on a basal bolus insulin therapy of 3 to 4 injections per day or continuous subcutaneous insulin fusion or insulin pump therapy. Women with type 2 diabetes should switch to insulin once pregnant. The MITEI study will determine if adding metformin to insulin is efficacious. It is suggested that we individualize insulin therapy with close monitoring. For the bolus insulin, one may use Aspart or Lyspro instead of regular insulin. And for basal insulin, one may use Detimer or Glargine as an alternative to NPH in women with type 1 diabetes. And in women with type 2 diabetes, one can use either of those two insulins or NPH is acceptable. During pregnancy, one should perform self-blood glucose monitoring both before or preprandial and after or postprandially. The goals for blood sugars during pregnancy include a fasting and preprandial blood sugar of under 5.3, a one hour postprandial blood glucose of under 7.8, and a two hour blood glucose under 6.7 millimoles per liter. One should aim for an A1C during pregnancy of less than or equal to 6.5% and ideally under 6.1% if possible in order to lower the late stillbirth and infant death. One should individualize targets in those with severe hypoglycemia or hypoglycemia unawareness. All women with type 1 diabetes 
should consider the use of continuous glucose monitoring during pregnancy as it has been shown recently in a randomized trial that women using continuous glucose monitoring had a decrease in large for gestational age infants, a decrease in neonatal intensive care unit admissions over 24 hours, decreased neonatal hypoglycemia, and reduced infant length of hospital stay. One should encourage weight gain according to the Institute of Medicine recommendations. It is suggested that women take aspirin to reduce the risk of preeclampsia starting at 12 to 16 weeks of gestational age in women with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. The following table indicates the Institute of Medicine guidelines for gestational weight gain for singleton pregnancies according to pre-pregnancy body mass index. And these are the recommended guidelines. For women with pre-existing diabetes during pregnancy, it is recommended that all women receive retinopathy surveillance in the first trimester. Visits thereafter are recommended if needed, and more often in those with more severe retinopathy, a large drop in hemoglobin A1c, or poor glycemic control. In women with nephropathy, it is imperative that they achieve good blood pressure control and they should be observed for hypertension and preeclampsia. For women receiving beta-methasone, it is recommended that an algorithm be used to increase the insulin dose in order to prevent severe hyperglycemia. This table, uh, as shown, recommends an increase of 25% the first day after the first dose the second and third days, it is recommended that all insulin doses be increased by 40%, day four by 20%, day five by 10 to 20%, and a gradual taper of insulin doses thereafter and as needed. Fetal surveillance should be started at 30 to 32 weeks gestational age and then should be done weekly from 34 to 36 weeks until delivery. Earlier onset and or more frequent surveillance is suggested for those at highest risk. For uncomplicated pregnancies, induction should be done at 38 to 39 weeks gestational age to decrease the rate of stillbirth. Induction prior to 38 weeks for other fetal or maternal indications may be necessary. Recommendation seven for women with pre-existing diabetes. Once pregnant, women with pre-existing diabetes should receive care by an interprofessional diabetes healthcare team, including diabetes educators, obstetrical care provider, a physician or nurse practitioner with expertise in diabetes and pregnancy to minimize maternal and fetal risks. Once pregnant, women with type 2 diabetes should be switched to insulin for glycemic control. Other non-insulin antihyperglycemic agents should only be discontinued once the insulin is started.
Pregnant women with pre-existing diabetes should receive an individualized insulin regimen and glycemic targets, typically using intensive insulin therapy by basal bolus injection therapy or continuous subcutaneous insulin infusion. They should strive for a, to target blood glucose values of under 5.3 fasting and preprandial, one hour postprandial under 7.8, two hour postprandial under 6.7 millimoles per liter. Women should aim for an A1C of less than 6.5% during pregnancy or under 6.1% if possible and can be achieved safely to lower the risk of late stillbirth and infant death. Women should be prepared to raise the blood glucose and A1C targets in the presence of severe hypoglycemia during pregnancy. Women should perform self-monitoring blood glucose both pre and postprandially to improve pregnancy outcomes. Healthcare providers should discuss, discuss appropriate weight gain at the initial visit and regularly throughout pregnancy. Recommendations for weight gain during pregnancy should be individualized based on the Institute of Medicine guidelines by pre-pregnancy body mass index to lower the risk of large for gestational age infants. Aspart, Lyspro, or Glulucine may be used in women with pre-existing diabetes to improve postprandial blood glucose and reduce the risk of severe maternal hypoglycemia. Detimer or Glargine may be used in women with pre-existing diabetes as an alternative to NPH and is associated with similar perinatal outcomes as NPH. Recommendation 13. Women with pre-existing diabetes should start aspirin 81 milligrams daily at 12 to 16 weeks gestation to reduce the risk of preeclampsia. Of note, 81 milligram is commonly used in Canada due its, to its commercial availability, but the optimal dose has yet to be determined. Recent evidence suggests that higher dosage regimens might provide additional efficacy. Recommendation 14. Women with type 1 and insulin-treated type 2 diabetes who receive antenatal corticosteroids to improve fetal lung maturation should follow a protocol which increases insulin doses proactively to prevent hyperglycemia and diabetic ketoacidosis. Women with type 1 diabetes in pregnancy should be offered the use of continuous glucose monitoring to improve glycemic control and reduce neonatal complications. In women with pre-existing diabetes, assessment of fetal well-being should be performed at 30 to 32 weeks gestation and weekly starting at 34 to 36 weeks gestation and continued until delivery. Earlier onset and or more frequent fetal health surveillance is recommended in those considered at highest risk. In women with uncomplicated pre-existing diabetes, induction should be considered between 38 and 39 weeks of gestation to reduce the risk of stillbirth. Induction prior to 38 weeks of gestation should be considered when other fetal or maternal indications exist, such as poor glycemic control. The potential benefit of early-term induction needs to be weighed 
against the potential for increased neonatal complications. Management in labor. During labor, monitor blood sugars closely and keep blood glucose levels between 4.0 and 7.0 millimoles per liter to reduce neonatal hypoglycemia. An insulin pump can be continued in women who choose to stay on their pump and they or their partner can independently manage the pump. Recommendation 18. Women should be closely monitored during labor and delivery, and maternal blood glucose levels should be kept between 4.0 and 7.0 millimoles per liter in order to minimize the risk of neonatal hypoglycemia. The insulin pump or continuous subcutaneous insulin infusion may be continued in women with pre-existing diabetes during labor and delivery if the women or their partners can independently and safely manage the insulin pump. Postpartum considerations. Women with pregestational diabetes should be carefully monitored postpartum as they have a high risk of hypoglycemia with loss of placental insulin resistance. All women should be encouraged to breastfeed since this may reduce offspring ob obesity, especially in the setting of maternal obesity. Metformin and glyburide may be used during breastfeeding as they appear to be safe but no long-term data is available. It's essential to screen for postpartum thyroiditis with a TSH at six to eight weeks postpartum in women with type one diabetes. Recommendation 20, insulin doses should be decreased immediately after delivery below pre-pregnant doses and titrated as needed to achieve good glycemic control. Women with pre-existing diabetes should have frequent blood glucose monitoring in the first days postpartum as they have a high risk of hypoglycemia. For women with pre-existing diabetes, early neonatal feeding should be encouraged immediately postpartum to reduce neonatal hypoglycemia. Breastfeeding should be encouraged for a minimum of four months to reduce offspring obesity and later risk of developing diabetes in women with GDM. Women with pre-existing diabetes should receive assistance and counseling on the benefits of breastfeeding in order to improve breastfeeding rates, especially in the setting of maternal obesity. Women with type 1 diabetes should be screened for postpartum thyroiditis with a TSH test at two to four months postpartum.
Metformin and or glyburide may be used during breastfeeding. Other non-insulin antihyperglycemic agents should not be used during breastfeeding as safety data do not exist for these agents. Now we turn to gestational diabetes, prevention, screening, and diagnosis. In women at high risk for gestational diabetes, based on pre-existing risk factors, nutritional counseling should be provided regarding healthy eating and prevention of excess weight gain in order to reduce the risk of developing gestational diabetes. It is recommended that universal screening for gestational diabetes be done at 24 to 28 weeks gestational age. One can screen earlier if there are risk factors for type 2 diabetes. Women at high risk for type 2 diabetes should be screened with an A1C or fasting plasma glucose if the A1C is unreliable in the first trimester. An A1C of greater than or equal to 6.5% or a fasting plasma glucose of greater than or equal to 7.0 millimoles per liter is suggestive of type 2 diabetes and the patient should be treated as such. One needs to confirm the diagnosis postpartum. Women at high risk for overt diabetes, based on risk factors, should receive a, an A1C at the first antenatal visit. If the A1C is greater than or equal to 6.5%, then the patient should be considered to have overt diabetes and referred for diet and self-blood glucose monitoring, and one should follow the same guidelines as pre-existing diabetes. One needs to confirm the diagnosis postpartum. If the A1C is 5.9 to 6.4%, one may consider this patient at risk and consider referral for diabetes diet and self-blood glucose monitoring, although the benefit for this is not yet established in this situation. Postpartum, a 75 gram oral glucose tolerance test should be done to confirm the diagnosis. If the A1C is under 5.9%, rescreen with an oral glucose tolerance test at 24 to 28 weeks gestation. Diabetes Canada looked to the HAPO study to decide on diagnostic criteria. The HAPO study was a large cohort study that looked to see if there was a threshold for, of glucose category after which the incidence of adverse outcomes rose. Here you can see glucose categories on the x-axis and on the y-axis you can see frequency of uh, birth weight over 90th percentile in the top left-hand corner, primary section, top right-hand corner, neonatal hypoglycemia, top le uh, bottom left-hand corner, and cord blood C-peptide, bottom right-hand corner. As you can see, the incidence of these adverse outcomes increase along a continuum and there is no definite threshold above which the adverse outcomes increase dramatically. If there is no obvious glucose threshold above which there is an increase in adverse outcomes, how does one select the threshold for diagnosis? One could select the glucose category that represents a threshold where women had a 1.7 times higher likelihood of adverse outcomes compared to women with normal glucose tolerance.
This slide shows the two approaches for GDM diagnosis. In both approaches, if there is a high risk of type 2 diabetes based on multiple clinical risk factors, screening with an HbA1c should be offered at the first prenatal visit. In the preferred approach, screening should be done with a 50-gram glucose challenge test and a one-hour post-glucose uh, test done. If the one-hour post-glucose test is under 7.8 millimoles per liter, the test is normal. If the one-hour test is between 7.8 and 11.0 millimoles per liter, the patient should go on to receive a 75 gram oral glucose tolerance test with glucose measurements done fasting one hour and two hour post glucose. If one value is equal to or greater than the following results, fasting 5.3, one hour 10.6, two hour 9.0, then the diagnosis of gestational diabetes is made. If on the one hour 50 gram glucose challenge test, the result is equal to or greater than 11.1 .1 millimoles per liter, then the diagnosis of gestational diabetes is made and there's no need to go on to the two hour OGTT. In the alternate, alternative approach, one does not need to do a 50 gram glucose challenge test one would go straight to a 75 gram oral glucose challenge, challenge test with a fasting one hour and two hour post glucose done. If any of the values equal to or exceed the following, the diagnosis is made. Fasting greater than or equal to 5.1, one hour greater than or equal to 10.0, and two hour greater than or equal to 8.5. In the HAPO study, depending on which approach one took, there was a, quite a big difference in the percentage that would be diagnosed with gestational diabetes. If one used the odds ratio of 2.0, or what we call the preferred approach, 8.8% would be diagnosed with gestational diabetes. If one used the odds ratio of 1.75, which we call the alternative approach, 16.1% of the cohort would be diagnosed with gestational diabetes. Recommendation 25, gestational diabetes prevention. In women at high risk for gestational diabetes based on pre-existing risk factors, nutrition counseling should be provided on healthy eating and prevention of excessive gestational weight gain in early pregnancy, ideally before 50. All pregnant women not known to have pre-existing diabetes should be screened for gestational diabetes at 24 to 28 weeks of gestation. The preferred approach for the screening and diagnosis of gestational diabetes at 24 to 28 weeks is the following. Screening for gestational diabetes should be conducted using the 50 gram glucose challenge test administered in the non-fasting state with a post-glucose measured one hour later. A post-glucose between 7.8 and 11.0 at one hour is a positive screen and is an indication to proceed to the 75 gram OGTT. A post-glucose of greater than or equal to 11.1 .1 millimoles per liter is diagnostic of gestational diabetes and does not require a 75 gram OGTT for confirmation. If the glucose challenge test screen is positive, a 75 gram oral glucose tolerance test should be performed as the diagnostic test for GDM using one of the following criteria. Fasting, plasma glucose greater than or equal to 5.3 millimoles per liter or one hour plasma glucose greater than or equal to 10.6 millimoles per liter or two hour plasma glucose greater than or equal to 9.0 millimoles per liter.
An alternative approach to screen and diagnose gestational diabetes is the one-step approach. A 75-gram OGTT should be performed with no prior screening 50-gram glucose challenge test as the diagnostic test for GDM using one of the following criteria. Fasting plasma glucose greater than or equal to 5.1 or Women identified as being at high risk for type 2 diabetes should be offered earlier screening with an A1C test at the first antenatal visit to identify diabetes which may be pre-existing. For those women with a hemoglobinopathy or renal disease, the A1C test may not be reliable and screening should be performed with a fasting plasma glucose. If the A1C is greater than or equal to 6.5%, or the fasting plasma glucose is greater than or equal to 7.0 millimoles per liter, the woman should be considered to have diabetes in pregnancy and the same management recommendations for pre-existing diabetes should be followed. If the initial screening is performed before 24 weeks of gestation and is negative, the woman should be re-screened as outlined in recommendations Women should receive nutrition counseling by a registered dietitian to achieve their nutrition, weight, and blood glucose goals. They should eat a healthy diet and replace high glycemic index foods with low glycemic index foods in order to reduce the need for insulin initiation and decrease birth weight. One should discuss appropriate weight gain and healthy lifestyle interventions throughout pregnancy. We recommend weight gain according to the IOM recommendations, which are based on pre-pregnancy body mass index to reduce large for gestational age and C-section rates. This slide shows the recommended rate of weight gain and total weight gain for singleton pregnancies according to pre-pregnancy body mass index. Women should perform self-monitoring blood glucose readings, both fasting and postprandially, in order to improve pregnancy outcomes. For glycemic targets, fasting and preprandial blood glucose should be under 5.3 millimoles per liter, one hour under 7.8 millimoles per liter, and two hour under 6.7 millimoles per liter. If glycemic targets are not achieved within one to two weeks, one should initiate pharmacological therapy. In terms of gestational diabetes management, in those who still have hyperglycemia despite diet and lifestyle intervention, insulin is still the first line of treatment. One may use Aspart, Lyspro, Glulucine, as perinatal outcomes are similar between these insulin analogs and regular insulin. NPH may be used for high fasting glucose. Metformin may be used as an alternative to insulin as there is good safety data in pregnancy and the ev there's evidence of less maternal weight gain, less large for gestational age infants, and less neonatal hypoglycemia when compared to insulin therapy. Women, however, should be informed that metformin does cross the placenta and there are safety data in offspring up to two years postpartum. Insulin has been necessary in approximately 40% of women who go on metformin and is often added to the metformin. Glyburide may be used in women who refuse insulin and are not well controlled on metformin or are intolerant to it. In terms of fetal surveillance, women with gestational diabetes should re receive increased surveillance who, who have poorly controlled glucoses and or women with comorbidities. Women should be offered induction at 38 to 40 weeks gestation to potentially reduce stillbirth and C-section. Earlier or later induction should be considered based on glycemic control and presence of other comorbidities. 
Recommendation 31. Healthcare providers should discuss appropriate weight gain and healthy lifestyle interventions regularly throughout pregnancy. Recommendations for weight gain for women with gestational diabetes should be individualized based on the Institute of Medicine guidelines by pre-pregnancy BMI to prevent excessive gestational weight gain and reduce the risk of LGA, macrosomia, and cesarean sections. Nutritional counseling by a registered dietitian should be provided to women with gestational diabetes to help them achieve their nutrition, weight, and blood glucose goals. Women with gestational diabetes should be encouraged to eat a healthy diet for pregnancy and to replace high glycemic index foods with low glycemic index foods to reduce the need for insulin initiation and decrease birth weight. If women with gestational diabetes do not achieve glycemic targets within one to two weeks with nutritional therapy and physical activity, pharmacologic therapy should be initiated. Insulin in the form of basal bolus injection therapy may be used as first-line therapy. Rapid-acting analog insulin aspart, Lyspro, or glulacine may be used over regular insulin for postprandial glucose control, although perinatal outcomes are similar. Metformin may be used as an alternative to insulin. However, women should be informed that metformin crosses the placenta, longer-term studies are not yet available, and the addition of insulin is necessary in approximately 40% to achieve adequate glycemic control. In women with gestational diabetes who decline insulin and do not tolerate or are inadequately controlled on metformin, glyburide may be used. Increased frequency of fetal assessment should be considered in women with gestational diabetes that are poorly controlled and or associated with comorbid conditions. Women with gestational diabetes can be offered induction of labor between 38 and 40 weeks gestation to potentially reduce the risk of stillbirth and the risk of cesarean section. Earlier or later induction of labor should be considered based on glycemic control and the presence or absence of other comorbid conditions. We now move on to management in labor. During labor and delivery, it is recommended that maternal blood glucose be kept between 4.0 and 7.0 millimoles per liter in order to reduce the risk of neonatal hypoglycemia. Recommendation 37. Women with gestational diabetes should be monitored during labor and delivery, and maternal blood glucose levels should be kept between 4.0 and 7.0 millimoles per liter in order to minimize the risk of neonatal hypoglycemia. We now move on to postpartum considerations. After delivery, one should encourage breastfeeding in order to reduce neonatal hypoglycemia, childhood obesity, diabetes, and maternal risk of diabetes and hypertension. It is recommended that a 75 gram oral glucose tolerance test be done between six weeks and six months postpartum to detect prediabetes or diabetes. Phone calls or email reminders are suggested in order to improve testing rates. This figure depicts postpartum OGTT testing. It is recommended that a 75 gram oral glucose tolerance test be done at six weeks to six months postpartum. If, however, the GDM was diagnosed early in the pregnancy, it is recommended that the OGTT be done at six to eight weeks postpartum. If the OGTT is normal, then healthy behavior is recommended. If the OGTT shows impaired glucose tolerance, or prediabetes, then healthy behavior interventions are recommended plus or minus metformin. If type 2 diabetes is found, then healthy behavior interventions are recommended and it is recommended that one follow the type 2 diabetes recommendations. Recommendation 38. Women with gestational diabetes should be encouraged to breastfeed immediately after delivery in order to avoid neonatal hypoglycemia and to continue for at least three to four months postpartum in order to prevent childhood obesity, 
and diabetes in the offspring. And to reduce the risk of type 2 diabetes, women should be screened with a 75 gram OGTT between six weeks to six months postpartum to detect prediabetes or diabetes. Methods to improve postpartum testing, such as phone calls or email reminders to women with a history of GDM, should be employed to improve screening rates. In women who were diagnosed with diabetes in early pregnancy based on an A1C, if ongoing hyperglycemia is not evident postpartum, a confirmatory test for diabetes should be done with a fast, fasting plasma glucose or 75 gram OGTT at six to eight weeks postpartum. Women with prior GDM should receive counseling regarding healthy behavior interventions to reduce the recurrence rate in subsequent pregnancies and reduce their increased risk of type 2 diabetes. In women with prior GDM who have impaired glucose tolerance on postpartum screening, healthy behavior interventions with or without metformin can be used to prevent or delay the onset of diabetes. Thank you.